like, what cloud? Okay. <laughs> All right, friends, welcome back to another episode of Beyond Ag Ed. I'm Coach Colleen. This is Coach Corey. And we have, well, right now we have a couple special guests. Yeah. Welcoming to the channel today, yeah. Courtney Castle and yeah. our first one. Hi, Noah. Say hi. Say hi. I'm just going to be shy now, aren't you? Only for a second, and then he's gonna he's gonna chime right in. So, Courtney, maybe just to get us started. Um, obviously, like I yeah. know you very well. I don't want to take yeah. over, um, you know, and and monopolize right. our time together. Tell us a little bit about you, how you got into AgEd, just a little bit of your backstory, okay. and we'll, we'll dive into the good stuff. Okay. Um. So, I guess I am in year thirteen of teaching. Um. I originally, so I live in Porterville, grew up here, did all the 4-H stuff, went into the high school program um, at Porterville, super active FFA kid, um, like I think most ag teachers are, um, and fell in love with it. I always knew as like a little kid that I wanted to do something with kids. Um, Originally, I thought maybe like a pediatrician, but I'm not a, a great person around like human blood, so that wasn't a good fit. Um, and then I realized with the ag program at high school that I could combine both all of my favorites with the FFA and ag and teaching. Um, so that's kind of how I got into ag ed. Um, I spent eight years at the high school level as an ag teacher. I was in a three person department. Uh, we had a lot of growth really quickly. And so we went from three to four and then to a five person department. And then back down to a four person department with a pathway that ended up collapsing um, completely. I switched through three principles while I was there. Um, and I can't even tell you how many vice principals during that time. Uh, from there, I left five years ago. So I'm in my fifth year out at a TK through eighth grade elementary school. We're a single school district. Everybody there wears multiple hats. Um, so I am our full-time eighth grade teacher. So I am a multiple subject teacher now. Um, on top of being our middle school FFA advisor, our principal and our superintendent because we do it all out there. Um, I have four kids. They are eight and under, seven and under. Emery will be eight in no. May. Uh, my three girls all go to school with me now. They're TK kinder and second grade and then the baby who's with us right now will be two in May. Um, I'm married to a high school ag teacher too. Um, he's actually at the Merced field day this morning with his ag mechanics team. Um, very different program from obviously mine. I'm a single single person department. Um, now he's in a seven person department six six or seven. I don't know what Larry has anymore. Um, but so trying to figure out the whole spring season uh, with his schedule and then obviously yeah. our crew of kids at home. So I don't know. Do you want more than that, Colleen, or is that a good start? <laughs> no, that's that's perfect because it gives us that kind of quick um, bird's eye view into who you are and, and kind of how you got here. I guess maybe first question and then I'll mute myself again since my voice is <laughs> stellar. How are you able to manage all of that with all of those hats? Um, it is a lot. And I know it sounds crazy on paper, especially when I list off like the admin role um, of a school district, but we are so small. So my entire student population out at Sausalito is a third or a fourth of the size of the high school program that I was a part of. Um, so in terms of student management, I went from teaching 120 to 150 students per day to, uh, right now I have seven students in my eighth grade class. Um, there's 72 students total in school this year. Um, so numbers wise, it's a lot less, um, behavior wise, because it is lower grade levels as well. Um, the behaviors, the attitudes, some of those heavier life challenges or issues that the high school kids have 
are non-existent at the elementary level. And even because we have middle school grades, because they're in such a small setting, they're not the same as a middle school setting where it's like six or 700 middle schoolers. So just st uh, student size alone has made, made a huge difference. Um, and that truly helps being able to kind of handle it all. Um, curriculum wise, um, as ag teachers, we end up doing so much in the classroom that connects to all of the different subjects that teaching ELA and teaching history wasn't much of a stretch besides looking at some new standards. And once you're a teacher and you know how to lesson plan, it doesn't change for whatever subject you teach. You just learn and adapt. And if you're, you put the time into your craft, you're going to be able to teach whatever subject you're given. Um, I'm very mindful of my time now. So I used to be, uh, leave the house at like 6.15, 6.30, get to work by seven or before seven. Um, and that was when I was driving 45 minutes to work too. And then I'd stay until 5.30, 6 o'clock or later if it was like an FFA meeting night. Um, our contracted work hours are 7.50 to 3.05. Um, and so I show up like 7.15 at the earliest, 7.30 most days. And then I'll stay on my late nights, five o'clock, maybe 5.30, but I'm 10 minutes from home now. Um, I do all of my FFA activities. All of our school activities are all during the school day. Um, there's really not a lot of outside of the school day activities or events for us. And so that has really helped with balancing and juggling everything. Um, I'm now very much more focused on what I have my ag students do being quality for them and not just trying to do every single event for the sake of doing every single event. Um, but honestly, I started doing that my last few years at Golden West. I stopped coaching a spring judging team um, because the time and the commitment um, and the desire to do the types of teams wasn't there with the students. And so I wasn't going to spend my time or give my extra weekends to coach a spring judging team that wasn't impactful or meaningful for any of us. And so I coached Citrus my last few years. I did a winter judging team. I was still meeting my student and community needs at Golden West. Um, but in terms of ag ed, I probably looked like I was slacking off because I wasn't in all the big spring field days, um, but I was having a bigger impact with my students. And the ones that really wanted committed wanted to be committed and be a part of the program were. And so I took that concept into Sausalito and the program we're building now. And so we're being very mindful about what we introduce our middle school students to, what activities they participate in, um, and then what activities I choose to use my outside time for. So I went from like a 225 day contract at Golden West. I think we were like 35 or 40 additional contract days. Um, I just nego negotiated this past year with our board for 13 additional days. Um, and that includes like summer uh, conference, state conference. I started up a citrus team. Um, so we did two Saturday competitions, but I'm very mindful about the time. Um, most of my admin stuff falls during the day too. So I'm juggling teaching and answering emails. Um, but really it's, it's a small program just with a, a larger budget than most ag teachers have. Courtney, when, He's just, excuse me, yeah. when, uh, so I think it was my first or second year at new professionals. Um, you came and spoke to the, the big group. Um, it wasn't just like a workshop and, you mentioned, you talked about the three ring circle mm -hmm. and how classroom was the most important and, and should be. Um, I've talked to Colleen about this many times. Actually, last week, we, we almost recorded half an episode on, on this. But um, I, I want to say, first of all, I appreciated that because it resonated with me. 
And I felt like nobody else felt similarly, or maybe I guess I wasn't having the right conversations. Um, what instilled that in you? Like what, when did you decide? Cause in college they preach it, you know, the three rings for goal, we need to have balance between the three and all three are important. When did you decide that classroom needed to be the most important? Um, it's funny that you bring that up, Corey, because I was taking notes off those questions Colleen sent me and I put classroom comes first, like as a new teacher, you've got to build the foundation in the classroom. Um, otherwise you're never going to grow your FFA and SAE. If you can't engage those students in your classroom, you're not going to engage them outside of the classroom because they're not going to trust you enough or feel comfortable enough with you to spend their weekends or their late nights with you. Um, I think for me, it's kind of a two-part reason why I've always had that philosophy. Um, first part, I came from a really active FFA program, and my teacher was great, but he focused on his leadership students. Um, the ones that were on the officer team were the same kids that showed, and they were the same kids on the judging team, and they were the year-round, like, 10 to 20 kids that he focused on. Um, which was great if you were one of the 10 to 20 kids and you got to do all of those activities. But as I went through the credential program at Cal Poly, I started to realize, you know, there was a lot of kids in our ag program. We were a three person department in high school. And I don't know all the kids I was in the program with. I know the close core that I was on the officer team with and the judging team with, but the rest of them that I mostly sat in class with, I didn't know those kids because they weren't really active outside the classroom. Um, and I didn't want to put all of my time and effort as a teacher into eight or 10 kids because then I'm missing the other 20 in my classroom on a daily basis that I might be the only person that they enjoy or the only class they enjoy coming to on a daily basis. Um, I got to see that a lot more too when I student taught. Um, my student taught at Pittman High School when Troy Gravat and Jake Dunn and Krista Vanest were there. Um, and you talk about just like the absolute best team, most well-rounded group of teachers to student teach under. It was phenomenal. Um, and they truly showed me that you can do all of it. Um, and capture as many kids as you possibly can when you focus on your classroom. And so those Pittman FFA meetings have like 200 people at them on a monthly basis, um, which blew my mind because I'd only ever had FFA meetings that had like 50 kids in it um, from a chapter of like 300 kids. And so to see such large FFA meetings, and it was because those three teachers focused on their classroom, um, really helped me like just resonated with me. Like this is, this is where I have to focus on is, is building the classroom. If I want to build an FFA program, if I want to have student success with SAE projects, I've got to grab them first and foremost in my classroom. Um, I still, to this day, think classroom first. Uh, I also think like, I guess is like job security. You weren't hired for FFA and you weren't hired for SAE. You were hired for a teacher position. So as a principal and superintendent, I've had to hire three teachers in the past five years. I don't hire them for all the extras. We ask in the interview, like, would you be willing to coach our soccer team or our basketball team? Would you be willing to help with our fall carnival? But I don't hire them on those things. I hire them on their ability to teach in the classroom. And ultimately, as ag teachers, that's what we're hired for is our classroom component first and foremost. If you're going to be released from a job those first two years, it's probably going to be because of your lack of ability in the classroom, not because you didn't do enough in your extended contract doing FFA or SAE. So I always just think like, that's where you have the biggest impact. That's where you can reach the biggest audience of students. How do you, so a lot of, I would say a lot of ag teachers, and, and to your point earlier, had really good experiences in high school, like through FFA or through SAE projects, or just even maybe just a classroom, a good classroom ag teacher. Um, that to you, younger teachers coming up and coming out, 
you know, they're, they might be hyper-focused on the FFA piece or the, the fair piece of things, um, or just, just competing in general. How do you get them to understand or, or get them to focus on the classroom? I guess, what, what advice would you have for them? This is a, a tough one. So when I was at Golden West, I had a couple teaching partners that came out after me that were very much, let's go FFA. And they burnt out and they left within the first few years because the classroom was not set. Um, as a, a veteran or experienced teacher hiring those newbies, I think it's really important that you sit down with them and you have the conversations about what went well in your classroom today? What did you do for your lessons? If teaching um, the same prep multiple times, so if you have three periods of ag biology, um, the experienced teacher needs to go into that classroom and say, hey, how did ag bio go today? How's your first period? What did you like? What did you not like? What did you change between the first time you taught it and the last time you taught it? And what would you do differently next time? Um, I know that's a lot to ask of our experienced teachers to do, but the reflective portion of lesson planning and teaching doesn't come naturally for a lot of new teachers. And even for experienced teachers, that reflective piece can be very tough, especially on a daily basis. Um, but if teachers aren't willing to reflect and look at their lessons objectively and not in the, oh, I'm such a bad teacher. That was awful. Like I, I suck at this and look at it as, well, I had a plan. It didn't go according to plan. I didn't like X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to change it. It has nothing necessarily to do with me as a person, um, but I need to get better. Then they're going to build that classroom. But if they're not willing to put that reflective piece into those first couple of years of teaching or have a mentor on campus that can help them reflect on daily lessons and growth, um, they're going to get lost really quickly. Um, it's, I think it's an interesting dynamic what programs you go into, um, what, what the history of the program is when you come in. Um, I always think I just, I fell into like perfect opportunities. So when I got hired on at Golden West, it was a three person department and they were hiring two of the three positions. And so it really gave us a chance to build and change the program, how we wanted it. Uh, and so it was, it was a chance to not just do what was always done with the status quo, but really get to come in and and build a team and build a program. Um, I think your, your young teachers, when they get hired on, some just get thrown into, well, we've always done it this way. That's how we operate. That's our tradition. And it may not be working anymore. And I think that's also a very hard one for a lot of experienced teachers to admit that what we're doing doesn't work anymore. Um, and so it's, that's a, that's a tough one because I think there's a lot there. Um, but I think it's, it's gotta be one of those honest and open conversations that I don't think departments are necessarily having. Um, and so I think it goes back to each program is going to have to sit down and have very hard conversations about what are they doing? What's working? What, what's not working? What students do we have? How are are we meeting the needs of our students? Um, how can we support our new teachers? Are we including them? Are we listening to their new ideas? Um, our veteran teacher at Golden West when we got hired was phenomenal. Emmett let Sandy and I run with all of our crazy ideas. And he went along with every single one of them. He'd ground us when we needed to be grounded. Um, and he would let us run when we were ready to run. And he was the one that would come in every single day at the end of the day, my first two years, and ask me how the day went. And I still, even after leaving Golden West, I still talk to Emmett on a regular basis. Um, and I think it's those relationships and those conversations that allow new teachers to survive and grow. And it lets programs change and flourish and, and grow too. You're very chatty. I have myself right. muted because of my cough drop situation. But if you could hear the number of times that I'm like, ooh, like, oh, that was good. 
I just, I really <laughs> appreciate your mindset and that focus on quality versus quantity. Um, and, and that reflective piece to the power, I think the power that it brings a program when those veteran teachers that maybe have been around that program for quite some time to be the one that goes into your classroom at the end of every day and asks how the day went. Um, I just think there's something really powerful in that in um, seeing and validating your young or new partners, really really being there for them and, and guiding them through figuring out that process. Um, a minute ago, you were talking a little bit about quality versus quantity and, and kind of decision as it relates to the FFA piece, you know, um, focusing on a winter CDE versus spring. And um, I forget how you worded it, but, oh, it was something about how people who maybe had a very specific type of experience themselves as a student, they come in as a teacher and they want to be FFA all the way, like right out the gate, but they haven't created that foundation in the classroom first. Um, a thought that <laughs> to mind with that burnout piece is that if we haven't, as educators, if we haven't spent the time to create ourselves and become the masters of our own classroom, and then you're trying to kids to level up outside the classroom, if you're not ready to hold that next level, you're going to be faster. So what would you say, what would you say to like those newer teachers that are already on the brink of burnout? What can or should they do so that they don't? Oh, so that, so I was at that point. So when I left Golden West, I didn't even know if I wanted to teach anymore. And when I took the spot at Sausalito, the scariest part about that job was being in the classroom. I had already made up in my mind that I was ready to move on. I was done with the classroom. I was tired. I was burnt out. I just, I was done. Um, and looking back at that, I think, Noah, can you stop, brother? Look, come here. Look right here. He really wants to touch the keyboard. Sorry. Um, I really think for new teachers that are on the verge of burnout, ready to leave the profession, what they really need to do first and foremost is to stop for a brief moment and think about what is causing the burnout. So is it the hours they're putting in at school? Are they getting there at 6 a.m. and working until 8 p.m.? Is that what's causing the burnout? Are they working every single weekend getting, I, I, this is a bad, I, bad way to put it, but I, are they, they spending every single weekend at a field day with the last place team? If you're going to put the time and commitment in to judge, to coach a team and yeah. take them to UC Davis, Chico, all of these overnight trips, just for them to get last place and not be competitive, why? What are you getting out of it? And what are those kids getting out of it? And so is that the cause of your burnout? Are you fighting student behaviors and lack of support from your admin in the classroom for discipline? And is that causing the burnout? Um, but trying to identify the source first of your burnout. And then from there, making the small steps and change of that burnout area. So for me, my burnout area was my administrative team. Um, my last principal and vice principal at Golden West were not supportive of the ag program. We had gone from having wait list for students in our classrooms to not being able to fill our classes um, because our curriculum and instruction vice principal said, well, people aren't choosing ag. They don't like ag. It's not important. They're picking it as number three and four. We're not putting them in your class. Um, and so we were fighting just day in and day out with admin to fill classes. Um, and it was tiring. Ah! I, out of eight years at Golden West, I fought admin for four of those years. Uh, and I stopped and I said, okay, this is, this is the burnout. Like I'm, I am tired of fighting to justify what I know leads to student success. We've seen success in our program already. And now you're, you're hindering our abilities to make our students successful. 
And so that's when I started my admin credential. And initially my thought was, oh, I'll become a vice principal at Golden West and I'll change it here. Um, but so I think for new teachers, you've got to find your burnout. What is, what is causing the burnout? Are you, I said, are you there all day, every day? And if so, why? Is it because you aren't keeping good lesson plans that you can fall back on every year? Is it because you aren't organized? Is it because you are trying to coach three different teams and advise four different species? There's nothing in the ag ed teacher handbook that says you have to do every single judging season, coach multiple teams, take animals to the fair, multiple animals at that amount. Um, there's nothing saying that we've created that monster ourselves. And so I think finding out what is your burnout? If it's strife at home because you have a spouse that has no idea what it means to be an ad teacher and your, your relationship is falling apart. Okay. Well then you need to sit down and prioritize is your relationship with your spouse more important than your job or is your job more important than your spouse? And uh, you know, it may go both ways, um, depending on the person, but I think really analyzing and figuring out where your burnout source comes from, because most of the time, everything being connected together, but there's one source that leads to all of that. So like for me, it was the principal and vice principal. We started getting really bad students, not as many students. We had to fight for our classes, which we have the following year. The kids in the program were no longer active. They were discipline issues. And that was because of the way the classes were being filled by, by that vice principal. But I mean, that leads to a ton of other issues. But most of the time, if you take kind of your own like personal analysis, you'll figure out where your burnout source is. You are a lot, brother. Yeah, I was going to piggyback actually off that last question. Um, so, you know, you talked, Courtney, about kind of the, the quantity over quality in a way um, mentality. And from my perspective, sometimes I feel like there's that pressure to perform, especially for younger teachers, and, and maybe not even perform, but just to check boxes. Um, well, look, I coached two teams and I was in charge of hogs and, and turkeys and, you know, all, all of this other shit that they feel obligated to take on and to, to prove their worth. Um, you know, you talked earlier too about if it's not working the old way and we kind of keep kicking the same can down the road, then we're not, we're not going to get different results, you know, kind of combining those two together do you feel like there's it's more beneficial for a young ag teacher to focus obviously on the classroom piece but maybe pick one thing to try to be good at because if they're going to these field days and coaching two teams and both of their teams are non-competitive like mm -hmm. that that's a, that of course is going to lead to that burnout piece so do you, do you would you suggest maybe just focusing on one other thing to get started and get good at that first I definitely would. So I, I've always been a firm believer of not, not overdoing it with the judging teams or the fairs because it, it goes, it falls back to my philosophy of the classroom. Like I'm a classroom teacher first and foremost. And if all I'm doing are jackpot shows and fairs with my 20 kids, I'm missing all these other kids. Um, and so I've always been a firm believer, like I'm only going to do one or two things and we're going to do it really, really well. We're going to make it worth the student's time and we're going to make it worth my time um, versus trying to do everything. And so I'm actually at that point now, a new program where I'm so thankful that that's my, my philosophical belief as a teacher. Because coming in as an experienced teacher, but having to build a program from the ground up I feel kind of like a new teacher again, where I'm like, what do I do? Do we do it all? Where do we go first? But you don't have to, like, I'm not doing it all. I don't go to any of our sectional, like fun activities. So we had a, a glow in the dark activity, dodgeball game Wednesday night for our section. I didn't take my students. 
Um, one, I still have a hard time with like the middle school students that are like 11 and 12 playing dodgeball against like a 17 or 18 year old senior. So for me, I'm like, Ooh, like we'll, we'll pass on this one, but I don't, I'm sure it's fun, but it's not necessarily impactful for my students right now. And so really focusing the way I've done it is I look at what's everything on the calendar for Agate? What's everything in my section? What's everything in the region? And what's everything in the state? And then I'll pick one or two things a semester at each level to focus on. Um, so for us in the fall, we do our sectional opening and closing contest. Um, and one citrus contest that falls in December. And then in the springtime, um, this year we added on the second uh, citrus contest. We did our spring regional meeting, and then I go to state conference with my students. Um, we have a May fair. And so right now I'm only open to uh, poultry. So I started with just meat chickens because I don't have livestock facilities. And quite frankly, up until this last spring, we didn't even have a school van. We only had a bus in our school district. And I was like, how am I going to do project visits? Like, I don't want to always have to use my own personal vehicle. And so I was like, you know, what? we can do chickens. That's easy enough. Um, but looking at each calendar and figuring out what's one or two things that I can introduce my students with, and then we can grow from there. And so my kids this year that did citrus, last year we only did one contest we did two this year they want to learn reasons next year and actually compete all the way through state finals which gives us four, four contests that they want to do that so we're building as we go um same thing with my fair projects so my fair is in may um it's a community fair we also have our county fair in september i'm choosing not to do our county fair anytime soon um, because that means summer projects, that means traveling 35, 40 minutes to the fair daily. Um, and my situation is unique too, because my kids don't drive. So I'm 100% dependent on their parents or myself to get them places. But Porterville Fair, we've expanded to market turkeys. And so I'm going from five chickens showing, or five kids showing chickens to five kids showing chickens and five kids showing turkeys. So I've doubled the quantity of showmen. Um, and just to put it in perspective, I only have 14 kids on my FFA roster because we're that small of a school, but I have them all doing something like really impactful and meaningful. Um, and so I think if you start small and you focus on those one or two areas, you get to see it grow and then you get to control the growth. So instead of saying, I'm gonna load a van up with 30 kids, and take them all to state conference. And those 30 kids haven't done anything all school year, besides maybe attended a couple chapter meetings. Are they really getting anything out of that activity? Um, so really focusing, looking at those, those activities, um, your chapter level activities too. What are you doing that brings impact to the chapter? What kind of monthly meetings are you holding? Are you holding meetings that have been held forever and nobody attends them? Let's change them. Maybe we need to do some lunchtime meetings to get kids to come to meetings versus the 6 p.m. meetings. Uh, maybe we need to go where we just do legit free food every single meeting all year to get kids there. Uh, maybe the activities aren't that great and we need to change what those activities are to entice the kids to come to those meetings. Um, for me, I run all of my FFA meetings on campus during the school day. We typically do them in the morning on a Friday um, through our flagpole ceremonies, and we have all of our students, our TK through our eighth graders, at our FFA meetings. Um, and that's because that's what works for our school. So I think part of it, too, as a new teacher is you have to know your demographic, you have to know your student and your parent population, um, and determining what's going to work. If you come into a program that has historically had, like, just a kick-ass livestock or meats team, and you're supposed to be the one that picks it up, I get that's a really tough spot to be in. Um, and it may be one of those that you find an expert in the state of California. There's lots of ag teacher experts in these different judging competitions and ask the questions, ask for help. Say, hey, I know historically my chapter has been great at livestock judging and I know nothing and I'm supposed to coach this team. 
Can you give me some pointers? Um, and then after a year or two, because there's always that tenure issue too, right? You don't want to piss everybody off your first year or second year of teaching because you're going to be let go. Um, you bite your tongue for two years, do the best you can coaching. And then if you don't have the following for that team or the passion, you don't coach that team after that. Because realistically, in about three to four years, that program is now going to be your program. And all of those students that knew the previous ag teacher and previous ways are usually gone and done. Sorry, that was like a big bird walk all over about <laughs> how to build and where to build. <laughs> To be honest, Courtney, so I was like when they were trying to push for this middle school FFA thing, I was like, this is not going to work like this. I, I had a lot of doubts towards it. Um, and maybe it's just, you know, kind of the, the the layout of your school and your program. But I think that if you want to get kids interested in this this organization, what better way than to do an 8 a.m. Friday morning meeting? where the kindergartners all the way up through your eighth graders are all there. I mean, those kids are going to get that for six, seven years, some of them. I mean, how great is that? Because you're you're hooking them so quickly um, where they're going to hit the ground running by the time they hit high school. And that's that's awesome. Yeah, it's it's completely different, Corey, than anything I ever thought I would be doing. Um, and it's a completely different model of ag ed than any of us know. Mm -hmm. So all of us have come from a comprehensive, for the most part, comprehensive nine through 12 active FFA program. Ag ed is high school only. Um, and it takes, it's going to take a lot, um, in our state to make that transition or that change to the lower grade levels. And it's difficult conversations and it's, it's a lot of gray area to work in because we've never been in this type of situation. Um, and there's, I know that there's a lot of people angry about middle school FFA programs still in the state. Um, and that they, they see it as a threat to the organization that we're in some, I don't even know what way, diluting the quality of ag education but like you said, Corey, when you have an opportunity to work with a five-year-old who understands that the chickens being raised in the middle of campus are going to become dinner in eight weeks, and they're so excited to do that program or that project in six years when they get to seventh grade, mm -hmm. they're sold. They're ready to go. Um, I can tell you one of the most rewarding things right now that it is better than any silver bowl, silver bowl that my students earned or state proficiencies when I was coaching high school is seeing my eighth grade graduates in high school ag programs and being active members. So I have a freshman at Menachee that just won the sectional BIG contest. I have four of my past graduates ranging from freshmen to juniors that are going to be showing at Portable Fair this year, chickens, turkeys, and market lambs. Um, I have one right now, um, actually at Merced Field Day, competing on the Agnet team at Porterville High School. Um, I have one at Mission Oak High School. He's a junior in, a, in the ag program. He's doing all the Agnet um, classes, so he's going to be a pathway completer. Um, getting to see that, like I never realized, like it gives me chills right now thinking about these kids, like just the impact, like the follow through you get to see um, when you start them so young and in elementary and middle school, you don't have to do everything with them. You just have to give them enough to bite and get them to the next level and then just let them let them go. I get to see my my graduates at opening and closing contests, at regional meetings. It's just, it's like the best thing ever. It is really like just, I absolutely love it. And Jared, so Jared knows the Sausalito kids too, because when we go places, Obviously, him and I will be like, hey, and like hang out with our kids. And so all of my kids know Mr. Castle. And so Izzy, one of my kids that's at Agnec today, Jared came home a few weeks ago from Arbuckle. And I was like, hey, I saw your tall kid from a couple of years ago. And I was like, Izzy? And he's like, yeah, Izzy, I saw him today. And I was like, oh, my God, he's doing Agnec. Like, this is so good. And so just I, you build those connections so much earlier with kids 
than when you get them as freshmen and you have to try to sell them on the program. And so I think if we could mm -hmm. focus on that aspect of middle school, um, we could really see some transitional changes that would be really beneficial for ag ed overall. Like I am a hundred percent advocate now for, for elementary and middle school ag ed, but honestly, I grew up in ag like from the time I was a kid. And so why would we prohibit anybody else from having those same opportunities? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how cool too, for your current students to get to go to some of these contests and see your prior students, the connection you still have, the connections they're now making with new people and new opportunities to see that full circle. Um, it's just, that's it. Like, I mean, that's the, that's the secret sauce right there. Um, we've talked a lot so far this morning, just about that, even more so than finding balance between personal life and career. I think just a resounding theme of quality over quantity, um, and to kind of transition into looking at the profession for a minute, what adjustments, what changes do you think we could implement, um, that would maybe help us continue to grow as a profession not just in terms of numbers, because we talk all the time about the attrition rate and how many people are coming out of student teaching, but what are some of your thoughts on what can we do to grow? And as you're saying, grow that depth in our profession, um, grow quality professionals that I think have um, maybe not the exact same mindset, but a mindset along the lines of yours that is really forward thinking it's about depth and breadth and not just the glitz and glamour that everybody wants to come out clamoring for. Oh, so <laughs> that's a big one, Colleen. I know. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, I think it goes back to us as educators. Like we have to put quality into ourselves. We have to be willing to work on ourselves. If we are promoting professional growth and premier leadership to our students, we need to be practicing those every single day, whether that's in our home life, our physical fitness, our lesson planning, our roles on campus, all of that. So I think truly like within our profession, we have to look at teachers first and foremost, like are we creating quality teachers? Are we giving our teachers coming out of our universities everything they need to to become quality educators? Are we focused on making sure they know where curriculum resources are? They know how to lesson plan. They know how to balance their time. They know that it's okay to show up at contracted work time and leave at contracted work time if they got their job done. Um, I truly think like when it, you look at all of this, um, you're always going to have issues with student engagement and student behavior and discipline because there's a whole other episode we could do, probably multiple episodes, on the newest generation of students and the lack of respect and the lack of parent support and, and the incessant need for technology and that all by itself. But in terms of our profession and educators, the quality has to come from within us first and foremost. We have to be willing to constantly work on ourselves day in and day out. If we're not willing to be a lifelong learner ourselves and model that for our students, we're never going to be able to get to that perspective of, I'm going to focus on quality in my students and I'm going to set the bar here for my students and know that they can reach it. Um, I think so often we have teachers that come in and they think teaching's easy and they think all, all they have to do is show up, they have to present a lesson and then they go home and they don't realize that it's not easy and it's not standards based and it's not curriculum based, it's heart based. Every single kid walking through your classroom every single day comes in with a completely different perspective. Um, I always fall back to, and I'm sure both of you guys have seen this, the iceberg, 
right? You only ever get to see what somebody shows you, the part of the iceberg that's above the water, and you never see anything else below that. That's us as educators. That's every single one of our students. That's every single one of the other staff members and community members that we interact with on a daily basis. There's always two sides to every single story. I think a lot of our teachers come in and are like, oh, this is going to be easy. Here's my lesson. It's ready to go. I'm going to teach it. My kids are going to learn and it's going to be great. And then you have a kid come and is like, F you, this sucks and throws the desk over and you're like, I didn't sign up for this. What do I do? Um, and so it's, it's got to start with us. And if you aren't healthy mindset and healthy body, I, you're going to suck at your job. Like, and it doesn't matter what job you have. You're going to suck at teaching. You're going to suck at being a nurse, whatever job you have. Like if you aren't healthy yourself, how are you going to be healthy for someone else? Um, so as a, as a new teacher, like you've got to, you got to focus, like, where's your quality? Is your quality on you? Is it on your students? Are you ready to put your big kid panties on and like buckle down and get the job done? One of my biggest pet peeves are teachers that are afraid to take their students out of the classroom. So you have programs that have these beautiful school farms and facilities and they don't take their students outside because it's too much work. I just, my mind is blown when I hear those things. Like, and I hear it a lot in our profession, like, well, you know, to go outside with the kids, that means I have to watch them more. They could get into trouble. There's, uh, you know, that's a lot of work to take that many kids outside. It's your job to take them outside. They will learn more in a greenhouse. Transplanting plugs than they ever will in the four walls of your classroom. But that falls back on the teacher, like your willingness. How healthy are you as a person? Like how strong-willed are you as a person? Are you really, truly willing to like buckle down and get the job done? Um, and so I think having those difficult conversations too with our newbies, like you have to be willing to take those chances and those risks, both for yourself and your students. Um, so yeah, my biggest pet peeve, like get your kids outside. If you have use of the space, take them outside. They will excel more. Like my, my biggest takeaway from the high school world, my best students outside in our horticulture program were my kids that were failing majority of their academic class classes. They were the hardest workers outside. My A students, oh yeah, they'll go outside and work and they're great too. But my ones that couldn't read and write at grade level that struggled with every single plant ID test, I take them outside and they can transplant a thousand plants in 40 minutes and they're happy and they're excited and they're engaged. And all it took was recognizing where they could succeed, what quality instruction looked like and what quality teaching from me looked like. Yeah. I'm sure you guys have both seen like those teachers that are like, I'm not taking my kids outside. <laughs> oh, just go, go out there. Preparation, right? Yeah. It's like just the work. Are you willing to put the work in? I think that's a, that's a big question. And, you know, you really touched on the personal development piece, which is a lot of what we're trying to get across here is, and this is for any profession, like you said, um, you know, and I'm going to act like I know you here for a minute because I follow you on Instagram, but you're a mom of four kids. You're a full-time teacher slash admin. Your husband is a full-time ag teacher and you still find the time and make a priority to exercise. So for all the excuse makers who don't have the time or the energy, what advice do you have for them? Just start. <laughs> You will never feel better about yourself if you don't start on yourself. So yeah, 4.15 is really fucking early in the morning. Like it's just no one, no one in their right mind, like really truly gets up that early. And that's the time Jared and I get up every single morning and we work out for 45 to 50 minutes. And it is the best 45, 50 minutes of my day. Uh, I feel better afterwards. I have energy all day. My mind is cleared. It just it works. It's hard to start. 
And we all know we, the three of us have done a ton of professional development. We know it takes three weeks to build a habit. Uh, but the commitment to maintaining that habit has to come from each person. Um, you're never going to get healthy and feel better if you don't start. And I think the biggest thing is most people are like, oh, I, just, I don't have time. And it's not a time issue. It's just they're not willing to put the work in on themselves yet. And it's usually not until they have like a major health scare or they start to have kids and they have trouble having children or they're having kids and then they can't keep up with their kids. That's when they start to work on themselves. Jared and I started working on ourselves before we had kids or got married because we realized we were like getting winded walking up flights of stairs. And we were in our mid twenties and we realized then we're like, Oh man, we are not going to be able to maintain like our college life forever where you go out to Marty's in downtown slow it on a Thursday night, stay out till two. And then you're back in class at 7am. Like that's not a thing indefinitely. And so as we age, as we mature, as our bodies change, we have to make sure our mindset matches that. And so what are you doing on a daily basis that allows you to be your strongest self mentally and physically throughout the course of your life? I've watched plenty of my family members have major health concerns and issues later in life. My dad just went through um, a knee replacement surgery about a month ago. It was prolonged six months because he was being stubborn and not putting himself first and fell and broke his hip and had to have hip surgery prior to the knee surgery. He told me during the, the hip and the knee surgery that when he gets strong again, he's going to start lifting weights. Unfortunately, I think for most people, they wait until something like that. And then they're like, I got to get stronger now. Um, but you've got to start now. Like you have to start now. You cannot start after you're already a hundred pounds overweight and you can't stand up and you're tired, like you've got to start habits now that build to being able to do a 50 minute workout six days a week. Um, I think part of it too, people are like, Oh, I'm going to get up and I'm going to work out. And they go like balls to the walls, that first workout. And then they can't walk for four days because they're so sore. And then they're like, give up. I'm not doing this. Like this is too much. And so I think building, like start with 10, 15 minutes, start with light weight, start with just body weight and build up until you're at that point where you're like, yeah, I can do this. Like, this makes me feel good. Like you have to know your body. Even if you just get outside and walk for 15 minutes and you've never walked before, that's better than nothing. And it doesn't have to be a morning. I know people that work out at 10 o'clock at night because that's what works for them. Um, but the the time excuse, it's because they don't want to. Um, they just, they're not ready to admit that they need to change. Um, but ultimately, it I, you and I both, everybody here knows it, it leads to so many issues later on. And it ultimately it impacts your teaching or your profession too. If you're not healthy, you show up to work and you feel like shit and then you eat like shit and then you don't perform the way you should at, at work or at home. And it all, it's all those layers, right. Of our little people onions, right. We all have these multiple layers. How strong are your layers? I mean, if you're sick all the time, you eat like crap, you sleep like crap, you don't work out. All of that plays into how you perform. And so for me, it's, it's non-negotiable. I work out Monday through Friday, Right now I'm doing Monday through Saturday because of the program I'm doing. Um, but I always wanted to be able to keep up with my kids. I never wanted to be that mom that was like, oh, I can't play with you right now because I can't move. I can't get down on the floor. I can't get up. If they want to go run around and play soccer for two hours, let's go. Let's do it. I don't I don't want to miss out on their, their years because I can't physically be a part of it. So I guess that was, that was always like my motivation now too, is I got to do this for them. And I'm raising daughters and I want, I want them to have a strong, solid foundation of what it means to be proud of yourself and confident. 
I don't want them to have to worry about body image or what somebody thinks they should look like. Um, I don't want them to think about the number on the scale. I want them to think about being strong, mentally and physically strong and capable of doing whatever they want. Some days that is so, so challenging because they are so independent already. And I want to pull my hair out with them. Then I'm like, oh my gosh, why? But I know indefinitely, like long-term, we're raising them the right way. They're going to be strong. They're already so stubborn and independent. Like they're, they're so strong-willed. We're doing the right things with them. They see us work out every day because we want to, because we enjoy it, because we take pride in ourselves. We don't work out as a punishment. We're not punishing ourselves because we overate. We enjoy all of it. We're living our lives to the fullest. And I like to think that that's translating to my kids here at home. And then I like to think it's translating to my kids at school and my staff at school. And that we're all creating this, this quality of life that I think a lot of people are missing overall. I think we live in a world where people shy away from adversity or, or they crack under adversity. Um, so I really appreciate the fact how you are, especially for your, for your kids, you and you and Jared are trying to set that example of building this character so that when adversity hits, you know, and you, I'm sure you deal with it with your students. Um, pretty much all ag educators are dealing with it with a different group of students now um, that, that has gotten even more has changed even more so since the last three years since I taught. Uh, I think them being mentally, physically strong and being able to practice these habits and rituals every day, um, it prepares them for anything life throws at them. And they'll, they'll be able over, they will be able to overcome those things. And I mean, they're, they're kind of one percenters, honestly, like, any bit of mental toughness now will overcome most of your peers because they don't have it. Mm -hmm. It's terrifying. The, the amount of, of kids and not even just kids, but we're seeing it in adults too, that cannot overcome adversity or cannot overcome failure or, or so afraid to fail that they're not even willing to try is mind blowing. I, I don't know when the, the shift happened to where we're afraid we're afraid to take chances we're afraid of hurting someone's feelings we're afraid of not succeeding we're just we're afraid so we just stay in a safe little bubble and only do what is mediocre and can kind of just take us day to day um i i just i don't i don't want that life for anybody like, I just, I couldn't imagine never wanting to push and grow, especially when this is all we have. We get this one life. We don't know how many days we're granted and you're just going to waste them away because you're afraid. What about the opportunity of growth that comes from that failure? You will never know if you can succeed if you don't try it in the first place. Um, I had to coach. So I coach all of our sports um, because we do intramural with the other schools around us. And so I just got done coaching our basketball season yesterday. We have a tournament. So we play three schools. Um, and my girls are not basketball girls. They're like, I don't like basketball. I don't want to do it. I personally like know nothing about the sport. Like I can't set up plays. I can stand on the sidelines and like yell at them. And I'm like Googling plays. My other teacher is like our basketball coach. She's great. So I'll ask her, I'm like, Michelle, what do I need to do? And she's like, oh, you need to have them stack. And I have no idea what a stack is. And so she explains it to me, but I was talking to the girls yesterday. They were tired. Again, we're a small school. So we have like seven kids that play basketball and cause that's all we have. And all these other schools have like 15 to 20 kids. And so my girls have to play three basketball games, 20 minute half. So 40 minute games. The first two games are back to back. They are running and hustling. Um, I don't ever yell at them like, you need to make more baskets. You need to do this. It's always give me as much hustle and heart as you can. Your effort is what's going to make me the most proud. We don't have to bring home, home the trophy. You don't have to win the championship. If you put everything that you can into this right now, 
I don't care if we fail, if we lose every single game. If you put your heart and you hustle in it, I'm good with that. I had, so we, we got third out of four teams. Like we won one game. We were close on the second game. Um, we were two baskets away and that was the difference between second and third place in the tournament. But my girls were correcting the ref. And to me, that's the character. That's the quality. The ref made the wrong call and gave the ball to us a couple times. And my girls stopped the game and were like, no, it was out on me. It's their ball. And they did that three different times. And if they had played on it, we may have made the baskets and come closer, but that that's the quality in life. That's the not being afraid to fail if you know you're doing it right. And so for me, like it just, you always, you always strive for the best. And if you fail, you still fail being proud because you gave it your all and you can always learn and grow from it. And so I get to see it in my students too right now. Um, and it's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's really cool. I just wish there was more of us around the world right now instead of what the world is. I think that kids especially, you know, and, and this is a, a message that Colleen and I have tried to portray through this this podcast, but people listen to fit people, you know? People that take their fitness, their personal development into consideration are just, they start to become leaders because of the confidence and just that that aura they put out to the world, right? That energy. People look at them and they're like, okay, he or she has it figured out. Like this person's got their shit together. And so I think kids pick up on that as well. And they they work to emulate, you know, the, those teachers, those leaders that put their personal development at the forefront of everything they do. And so, you know, that's that's the message that it's such a simple message, but such a hard point to get across, you know, and I know you've touched on it already, but um, how can we as just individuals work to, to help others like embrace that? So I think it goes back to the fact that people are afraid to admit their weaknesses. Everyone's so afraid to look weak. They're so afraid to have those failures uh, that I think they forget when they look at these people who are, are physically fit, who are successful, who are confident that they all had to start somewhere. And so I think if they really dive into some of those people's backstories and start to realize, Hey, they're just like me, or they started out just like me. Maybe those people that have put the years and the, the time in to get where they are now, if they reshare their their origination story and where they came from and everything that they had to go through to better connect. Because I think a lot of the times people are like, ah, there's no way, like I can't be at, at Sean T level. Like I'm doing Sean T's program that Colleen's doing too right now. And people look at him and they're like, there's no way I can be there. He's put 20 plus years into the fitness industry. Nobody's going to start on day one and look like him. It's years of consistency, years of hard work but you have to start. And so I think if you're in a position of leadership and you can share your story about how you've started, where you started and how long it's taken you to get where you're at, that transparency piece can really help um, get people excited and motivated to start their own journey. Um, I think it's the same thing with our teaching profession. Like those who are recognized as successful teachers in the profession Maybe they need to do a better job sharing their first couple of years in the teaching profession and what they struggled with and what went wrong and, and what were the bad moments and how did they overcome them? Because so often we highlight all the great things that they do, but we don't always talk about the struggles that someone had to go through to get where they're at now. Um, like, for example, I... I had a kid hide a whole bag of pot brownies in one of my drawers my second year teaching. Um, yeah, I did tell me I didn't blow your mind right now, right? So went to the bathroom, just like got up in the middle of class, went to the bathroom, um, came back, 
we were watching, I, I know I was watching with my kids. We were watching some movie. It was probably like a plant movie. Um, in all honesty, I could have been working on like a master's assignment because I did my master's my first two years. So I had a movie playing in my classroom, which isn't probably ideal, but I had something on the lights were dark. Kid comes back and comes up to me. He's like, hi, I had to go, go take a, a breather. I, I was having anxiety and he just reeked of pot. And I was like, all right, go have a seat. And I'm on my computer, like typing up to the front office, like come pick this kid up. He's high as a kite. He gets picked up and leaves. Mind you, my room's still dark. I can't, like, they're watching their movie. In the class, one of my kids is like, hey, he left something in your in your drawer. And I had counters all along the sides of my classroom with drawers and cabinets. I was like, oh, really? And I, I'm a little naive, like, second-year teacher. Like, kids are great. They don't do anything bad. Like, the worst thing I ever did in high school was drink on the weekends. Like, yeah, we, you know, you party on the weekends. It's not a big deal, right? I opened that drawer and no lie, like a fat sandwich bag with brownies, his joint and um, a bowl in it. And I was like, oh my God, what do I do? Like I was freaking out. I had kids coming in for the next period and they're like, hey, it smells good in here. And I'm like, you can smell it. We had spaghetti cooking for our officer meeting. And so you could smell the spaghetti, but I was like panicked, like, oh my God, what do I do? I just, no one prepares you for stuff like that ever. And now if I was in that situation, I would know exactly how to handle it. And when I have to handle tough discipline issues at school, I handle them like stone cold. You can't see any expression on my face. It's super professional, but that's come from years of experiences leading up to where I am now in one like, instance like that, my second year teaching, you never hear about anymore. And so I think as professionals, if we could go back to our beginning stories and share that more, we can build that connection with those newbies just starting out. But yeah, there's my funny story. I'm never going to forget that one. <laughs> now everybody knows it. That's awesome. Uh -huh. <laughs> it makes you even more, I mean, you are human. I know this and you're my friend, but, um, I think it's, I think it's helpful too, because <clears throat> not in a, in a negative or, you know, um, judgmental way, but sometimes we put people like on a pedestal that we look at that have figured some stuff out that we haven't figured out yet. I did this with you for such a long time, as you know, because I always thought that like you had everything together. You at least had the stuff together that I hadn't figured out yet. So like up on the pedestal you go, right. Um, but it's just, it's so humanizing to share those parts of our stories that like everybody's a first year teacher when they're a first mm -hmm. year teacher. Okay. I don't care how good you are. Um, I don't care what your family lineage is the first year or new teacher stuff. <laughs> it will come to bite you at some point, you know? Um, but, oh my God, I'm going to put that, I'm going to put that story like in the back of my cap and save that. That's amazing. Well, you're from, you said, Colleen, your first year, it doesn't matter like how you come into the profession. Your first year is your first year. You come out like guns ablaze blazing, like I'm going to do it all. I'm going to rule the world. Right. And then by winter break, you're like, I'm not even going to get close to get anything done that I thought I would. And then you go into your second year with that mentality of I'm not going to be able to do it all and the wind's out of your cells. And I personally think your second year is tougher than your first year because you come in with that perspective. Mm -hmm. But I think if you take that perspective and you're like, okay, let's tone it down a bit. Let's focus and reprioritize on what I can do and build from there. You can survive those first two years, but yeah, your first two years are, there's nothing like them ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Good time. Such cute know. little teachers in the beginning. <laughs> Um, well, I, I messaged in the chat, my battery's at 7%. Um, do we have any like final, final questions, final takeaways, um, last like motivational thoughts before, um, before we wrap up and it's okay if you say it doesn't. I, yeah, I, I feel like I over talked your like oh. 30, 40 minute time, Colleen. <laughs> 
Um, I do love though, that the whole time, um, anytime you're talking, obviously, like I'm looking in your square and every now and then it, uh, at uh-huh. the bottom of your door, I see like, like right now, like there's some little yeah. prints back there. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, I just, I took them out most of the time. Yeah, no. Uh, so good. So I guess I'll tell you a quick story. Oh yeah, yeah. There's one right here at the door. Like, so I have bedroom doors. Yeah. One of them's outside on the back patio right now, like <laughs> knocking. Um, so all three girls go to school with me, right? Everly's TK. Um, Everly throws the biggest fits out of the girls, like screaming, crying fits. I don't hear her most of the time because she's mine. Like I just, I, her, I just like right now, it's fine, Emery. Um, I just, I, I tune them out. Oh, one day she was screaming like bloody murder outside of her classroom. This was like when she first started school in the fall. Uh, and my kids all stop and they're like looking at each other in the classroom. I was like, what are you guys doing? And they're like, you don't hear that. And I was like, I was like, oh yeah, that's Everly. And they're like, she's been screaming like that for like two minutes. Like you didn't hear her. And I was like, no, she's mine. Like I just, I blocked her out. The whole school heard her screaming because all of our classrooms are side by side. So recess happens. Everyone's like, dude, what was going on with your kid? And I was like, I don't know. I didn't hear her. Like just parent blinders on the <laughs> whole time with that one. <laughs> so yeah, the little fingers and stuff. I'm like, oh, whatever. They'll be fine. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Well, um, thank you so much for agreeing to come on here, especially on the weekend um, when you're solo parenting with all four of them. We really appreciate you um yeah yeah. this was fun good well you're gonna be coming back for sure because there's too many things that I wrote down as you were talking like damn like that's a whole other you know as you said we could go on some of these topics um on their own so I guarantee we will be asking you to come back (laughs) um but thank you so much you're amazing yeah, you guys are too. I love uh, watching your YouTube videos, podcasts. I don't know what to call this. I mean, but either. I, I don't know. Cause I feel like if there's video, it's technically not a podcast, but like, I, but is it, it's not a vlog. Is it a vlog? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I like listening to them and watching them. So I think you guys are doing great things. So keep it up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you and for coming on, awesome. Courtney. Appreciate you. Huh? Thank yeah. you for coming on. We appreciate you for sure. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and we'll be seeing you next Monday.